Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about Tesla Energy, a couple stories there. We also have some news on Tesla Insurance, some lobbying done by Tesla in the United Kingdom, some background on Elon Musk, and a couple other stories as well. We'll start off with Tesla stock though. Tesla finished down 4.4% today to $676.88. That compared to the Nasdaq, which started strong, faded to red, and then finished just in the green, up a tenth of a percent. There was a little bit of discussion today ascribing the movement to the reassignment of Jerome Guillen from President Automotive to President Heavy Trucking. That's definitely not my assessment. There are always tons of factors going in, so I think to pinpoint it on something like that that is relatively small in the grand scheme of things seems a lot less likely than the impact of something like Volkswagen's Power Day, for example. For context, Volkswagen stock has jumped 18% so far this week. Again, we will be diving a little bit deeper into Power Day, likely on tomorrow's episode. All right, getting into Tesla Energy, the first story here comes from a LinkedIn post from Tesla employee Rohan Ma, who is responsible for energy products optimization. And yesterday he linked to a post that we had discussed previously, a Bloomberg article about Tesla's new battery project in Texas, saying, quote, With the auto bidder portfolio operating over 1.2 gigawatt hours in 2021, we're pumped to be launching in Texas this summer. Always interested to connect with people who have experience in ERCOT, end quote. ERCOT, of course, being the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, which is the organization responsible for managing Texas's electrical grid, of course receiving notable criticism in the wake of the Texas power outages. Anyway, not that we needed a ton more confirmation, but this is final confirmation that that is Tesla working on that Texas Energy project. The real interesting part here I thought was the 1.2 gigawatt hours being used with Autobitter. To date, or at least through the end of last year, Tesla had installed about 6 gigawatt hours of energy storage in total. Now that we're a decent portion of the way through Q1, they could have added even another gigawatt hour to that, so at about 1.2 gigawatt hours, that means that about 15 to 20% of the installed capacity is utilizing Autobitter software. I think that's the first data point that we have in terms of the scale of Autobitter usage, and that could be helpful for some future analysis. Another little tidbit here that may be interesting, maybe not, is Drew Baglino's comment on Rohan's post, which again links to Bloomberg's article on Tesla's energy project in Texas. Drew says, quote, excited for this Rowan team. Also, I just noticed another Tesla product in the drone shot, dot dot dot, end quote. If you look closely, there is a white, I believe, Model 3 in there, so that's probably what Drew is talking about here, but feel free to do a little Where's Waldo on that photo if you want, and if you see something else, let us know. There's also news here on a couple new Tesla Energy projects. This first one is from a couple weeks back. I don't recall seeing it reported. I'm sure someone's covered it, but we have not here. There is a new energy project in the UK, which will be using Tesla's Megapack for energy storage to the tune of 68 megawatt hours. Construction on this project is expected to be completed in June this year. The second project here has Tesla continuing to expand its reach in Israel. Tasmanian is reporting that Tesla has received a $30 million order for energy storage systems from Nafar Energy. Aside from that dollar amount, the energy capacity isn't given, but I would guess that it's probably somewhere in the ballpark of 75 megawatt hours. So like I said when we talked about Tesla's battery project in Texas, hopefully news like this becomes so commonplace that it's hardly even relevant on a national or international scale, and I think that's rapidly becoming the case. Just in the two weeks so far this month, we've already seen projects adding up to maybe 200, 250 megawatt hours, and those are just the projects that we know about. So definitely a lot of great news for Tesla Energy lately, especially coming off the incredible Q4 with about 1.6 gigawatt hours installed. Next up here, just a small bit of information on Tesla Insurance. This again comes from Green the Only on Twitter, who yesterday wrote, quote, So we all heard how Tesla Insurance does not use individual driving data. Well, the times are a-changing. 21.4.12 adds in collection of, quote, insurance telemetry, end quote. You may remember that Zach Kirkhorn talked about this on Tesla's Q2 earnings call last year, saying that the insurance product they were offering in California at the time was, quote, a fairly standard insurance product with elements of it that are unique to our cars, so you can think of it as version one of Tesla insurance, end quote, adding that, quote, what we're working on now is we can call it version two, or we can call it the first version of our telematics product. And so really, ultimately, where we want to get to with Tesla insurance is to be able to use the data that's captured in the car, in the driving profile of the person in the car, to be able to assess correlations and probabilities of crash, and be able then to assess a premium on a monthly basis for that customer. And what makes this very exciting for us is the amount of data that is available with the customer's permission to use is not available in any other product or any other vehicle in the world. So this gives us a unique advantage in terms of information, end quote. He then said Tesla had a choice of expanding their standard insurance product beyond California or leaving it in California for the time being, working on the telematics product, and then when that was ready to go, expanding to other states. Now in the last couple of weeks, we have seen Tesla file in Texas, Illinois, 
and also Washington to get ready for Tesla insurance. And then we see this mention of individual telemetrics showing up in the firmware per green. Now, I doubt anything is active in the current firmware. Tesla's probably just getting this in there to be ready. That would obviously require customer consent, but there's a lot of action here. And I think this will definitely warrant a question on the Q1 earnings call if we don't have more firm information on it prior to then. Next up here is an article from The Guardian today reporting on Tesla doing some lobbying in the UK to raise taxes on internal combustion engine vehicles. The Guardian says that in a submission in July last year, Tesla wrote, quote, supporting zero emissions vehicle uptake via mechanisms to make new fossil fueled cars pay for the damage they cause is entirely reasonable and logical. The result can be a revenue neutral system for the government, end quote. Tesla argued that 3,000 pound grants could be offset by just a 49 pound tax on each new internal combustion engine vehicle sold. Obviously that math works out right now because of the percentage of electric vehicles compared to internal combustion engine vehicles being so small. And since it is something that would be applied only on new vehicle sales, it would be something that maybe is not as broadly impactful as something like a carbon tax might be, but still kind of engenders that same type of logic. So again, that was just something that Tesla had proposed in the UK, but as we think about the US federal tax credit and how that situation comes into focus here, likely in the coming weeks, there's been a lot of discussion on that federal EV tax credit, but I haven't seen much on how to fund it. I think something like this would be a great way to do that. Maybe it scales up over time and maybe it starts above a certain price threshold, but I guess my hopes aren't too high in that regard. Just thought it was interesting to pass along in terms of what Tesla was suggesting. All right, next up here, this isn't really a news story, but over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of discussion around Elon Musk and his family history, particularly with his father. And some of that narrative has seeped into social media, I think especially as Elon Musk has become the wealthiest or second wealthiest, depending on the day, over the last year. So last week, a journalist that I've actually followed for a couple of years now and I have a bunch of respect for, Jeremy Arnold, published an article on this topic. Jeremy always does really great research, I think. He looks for the full story. He'd previously done a really good piece, I thought, on the Vern Unsworth versus Elon Musk situation. Anyway, if you're curious about learning a little bit more about that family history and some of the rumors that have gone around about wealth generated from South African emerald mines, things of that nature, I will put a link to this article in the show notes, and I'll just read a quick paragraph here. Quote, All said, to discount Elon's success much on account of these things seems a curious and not especially good faith reading of the data. The positives matter, the negatives matter, a healthy and fair telling of any story accounts for both, and on the balance I see less of a story of unusual privilege here, and more one of unusual determination. End quote. So given the lack of other Tesla news today, I thought I would share that, but Really, that is it for today. So as always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. Again, keep an eye out for that interview on PW Power Day, likely tomorrow. In the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and hopefully see you then for the Wednesday, March 17th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.